No. Uh, welcome, everybody. Oh. Come to this free intro. Oh. Hello. Hello. We have a, we have a oh. bunch, a few old people, the uh, German group, yeah. Christine and Annette Hanno, are, and, but we have some new people, Claren, Thetar. Where are you, Claren? Karen is a student of mine. You already had this individual lesson last year here in Wuppertal. Oh, yeah. oh he looks different on Zoom. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> great. Grown and up a little bit. Ulrika, are you another Hanno person? Nope. Nope? Nope? No, I'm new. <laughs> Where are you? Um, I'm in Vienna at home. Aha, uh -huh, great. Great. We're only, you're only four hours north i think yeah north, north. <laughs> four hours north of me and Sindon, i think is in the states somewhere are you not no anyway yes yeah, I, I live in, in the central central united states by the mississippi river minneapolis yep yeah and eric i forget whether we've we've uh, met already or not yeah you also met in Wuppertal. Wuppertal. Okay. Yep. Great. So Sinden, you are you're our lone North America North American in place, although I'm North American in origin. Well but before you came on, I was getting to wonder if I if if this lesson was going to be in English. I thought I'm I'm out of luck if because everybody's going what were you all speaking German? Was that what you were speaking? Okay. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you're in luck because my German is horrible, even though I've spent years teaching in Germany. All, all, right. the, all, all, my, all my German students speak English far too well, so I was never forced to learn. <laughs> so anyway, for those of you who are new, welcome to this free introduction to Pianimals. And for those of you who've, who've experience this particular lesson before it'll it'll of course come out a little different as it does every time so um i asked the question a while back why would we need another yet another piano method there's been literally hundreds of piano methods created over the years um <clears throat> so why another one well if you look at most of the piano methods they tell you what to do but they don't really tell you that much about how. Even something like a dozen a day, where you have these wonderful little staccato exercises, or whatever. These it's ridiculous little, ridiculously simple little exercises, which, which are very effective. Um, but they just give you, they notate staccato, legato, phrased, not phrased. And then they expect you to just do it. So I noticed from my Feldenkrais method background, because Feldenkrais practitioners deal, deal a lot with the organization of the body. Does the skeleton line up so that the muscles have very, very little to do? Or is the skeleton out of alignment so that the muscles have a lot to do? If I push like this, my bones are doing 95% of the work. If I push like this, my muscles are doing 80% of the work. So that has great implications for some something like piano playing. And um, so the how you do, what you do, becomes a very important question. And from the Feldenkrais point of view, I started noticing that in piano playing, many of the hows that we have been taught for generations are not really that well organized from a skeletal point of view from the, the how the skeleton works and so i started writing books the craft of piano playing honing the pianistic self-image all thumbs well-coordinated piano technique and uh, most recently play the piano with your whole self 250 awareness through piano movement lessons over those four books to try and get a, a sense of physically joined to the keys not falling into the keys not using the weight of the arm to move the key but sensing the weight of the arm to free it so that it could stand up and walk and sometimes leap 
efficiently. So seeing the hand as a mini body be became a metaphor from the Feldenkrais point of view. This, when the skeleton gets out of a chair, the body angles forward, angles forward until the weight is over the feet and then the legs simply extend like scissors. And it's virtually effortless. If the bones are well organized, if, if my head strains, if my head strains or my neck strains or my back strains, then it can be tremendously difficult to get out of the chair. So if we take the hand as a mini body, does the hand fall down? Every note it plays, or does the hand stand up and walk through a simple group of notes? So we start with really simple ideas like that, and then we extrapolate to, to cover many, many uh, different musical situations and particular ways of using the hand that uh, <clears throat> are needed for those particular musical situations. Um, and then, of course, we have to do the thumb because the thumb is an extremely special case where if you, if you hold your thumb like this, then it looks like it's one fifth of the hand. But if you take your thumb and oppose it to the fingers, then it becomes obvious it's actually one half of the hand. So you can feel the difference between playing the piano like this and standing the thumb up so that the so that the fingers are freer because they're actually carried by the thumb. Uh, and in pianos, we even we even do, I even had my 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 artist develop a a picture where the 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 hand is a mini body. And but the the thumb is a special kind of mini body that has no pelvis, where the top of the femur is attached directly to the spine. So we're using all sorts of you know, graphic things to to bring the animals the ideas, the ideas of my my big books, the two hundred and fifty awareness to piano movement lessons to kids, and also to studio teachers who can never you know make their way through all that literature that I've created. Uh, so I developed piano so that more people could use these ideas effectively to help their own playing and to help their, their, uh, their students playing. Um, so uh, it consists of eight sections. And uh, the eight week course which I offer which is starting on January 22nd and we're running for eight Saturdays uh, covers the eight sections so there's lying down and then the thumb and then standing up uh, then from walking to running and from running to rotating hopping and leaping then a little more on the fingertip before we do the whole body so Eight weeks are needed because each of these issues uh, is really, really rich in, in their application. And there are several, several exercises for each of these sections and several compositions that I've written so that you can apply the exercise immediately to, to music with yourself and with your kids. So uh, you can see there's, there's the illustrations are really great for, for getting kids to uh, have an idea of why they're doing what they're doing on the key. Some of the exercises are very weird, like this this elephant lying down and the baby elephant getting you know uh, getting his diaper changed by his mother. It's actually done lying down, lying down like this. Who plays the piano like that? Well, that comes from an idea that that all of us, none of us, walked on the first day. You don't pop out of your mother and stand up like a colt in a field. Uh, it takes a year. I think we're the longest of all the mammals in terms of the apprenticeship, the pre-standing apprenticeship. And we learn many of the things that we need to learn in order to stand up, lying down comfortably. No stress, no need to achieve. And so the whole first section of piano is lying down, is doing all sorts of stuff that you will never do as you play the piano. 
but the hand develops a sense of self. You develop a rich sensation of the hand from the inside, so that when it does finally stand up, it feels far more capable of doing so. You remember I, I showed you why would anybody play like that? Like that would be like walking down the street going right or feeling the weight of my whole body every step I take. The whole art of walking is in neutralizing that weight at every step so that you walk smoothly, seemingly weightlessly. But little kids, for a little kid, that key is very big and their fingers are very small. Us grown-ups, the fingers and the, and, the, and the keys are about the same size. But a little kid is very small. And so, of course, they're going to use their arm because they perceive the finger is not being strong enough. But amazingly enough, if you teach a little kid to, to stand up and don't even worry about whether the key goes down or not, just learn to stand up. Learn to walk from one standing finger to another standing finger. You see? I'm literally, I'm not pushing the key down. The key went down. How peculiar. The key went down, although I did not push it down. All I did was stand up. It's exactly the same movement that one would do if one was on another surface, not a, not a piano key. So when we free ourselves from the, the need to press that key down, then all of a sudden we're in balance. Gravity is providing the down force, and I provide an up force. My hip joint goes up when I stand up, while the hand's hip joint goes up when the finger stands up. The thumb is weird, like we said. It pushes the hip joint up. So I don't know if you're, some of your, 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 your screens, your cameras are turned off, and it may, you maybe you're, you're trying all these while I'm showing them. I hope you are. And... Uh, do you have any questions or any comments about what I've said so far about the, the need or the possibility more for a new piano method which really addresses something which perhaps has been somewhat neglected? The idea of, okay, we know what to do, but how do you go about doing what we do at the piano? Yes, Christine, did you have something to say? You're trying to unmute your mic, I see. Uh, I, have, uh, I have to leave now. <laughs> Pardon me? I have to leave now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sticking around. Okay. So, we'll see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Anybody else? I, we'll I, would, I would like to ask, um, when you did um, the demonstration of like walking with the fingers on the piano, yeah. Um, now you were sitting like in front to the computer, and did you do this because uh, that we would see it better on the computer, or is the exercise like that that because the finger was not like? So oh no, no, I was. Like, I'm, I'm talking to you, so I'm just kind of playing the piano on the side. Normally, I would, I would walk like this, and there you, you can see it. And it's interesting because the natural finger action moves me forward, you see? And that's, of course, normally when we walk down the street, we walk forward. We don't walk sideways. But, of course, you know, if I'm doing it, then, then, then I can... And there's actually uh, an exercise for playing scales where you actually learn to play the scale like that. You rest the forearm on the key. Louise Robine, a Chicago pianist and pedagogue, conceived this. And it's, it's, when I tried it for the first time, I thought this is completely bizarre. But somehow, when the, when the hand feels like it's walking, the same way that the human body walks, somehow it, it feels good, and then it something gets well organized and simple in the hand, and then the, the brain figures out how to transfer that to sideways walking, which is what we do at the piano. Of course, it's not completely sideways because now I'm going to angle, so already it's a little bit forward and back, a 
little bit forward and back. And here's a little backwards and forward. I'm actually walking backwards a little bit because the hands tend to be turned to the, uh, uh, how do you say it, horizontally rotated so that the fist finger is out and the thumb is a little towards the body. That tends to be, that tends to make uh, scales and arpeggios more facile so that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of half going sideways, half moving forward. And now I'm, so I'm half walking backwards and half moving sideways. That's a really great question because uh, in pianos, uh, some of the, the, the movements we do are forward and back. We even do a rolling forward and back like a judo roll so that the fingers feel how they can curl and uncurl without the usual um, stress of curling. But just if you, uh, the, the idea of Feldenkrais is to let the neuromotor system have new impressions and new sensations to learn new movements. So when the fingers are curled with none of the normal muscular effort of curling, the, the sensations in the joints, are much richer because muscular effort tends to uh, dampen sensation. But if there's no muscular effort, you're far more sensitive. And then the brain can feel how exactly how those bones want to fold in on themselves and unfold away from themselves and fold. And then if you give the brain enough of this kind of rich, neutral kind of passive food, then it will start using the muscles that curl the fingers very, very differently. It will now use those muscles actively to imitate what it just experienced. And so you can change a great deal how you do what you do by doing these sensorially rich, sensory enrichment exercises. And in the, in the teacher's manual, so maybe I should explain about pianos. Uh, the teacher's manual has uh, detailed written out exercises for each chapter. There's also a, a forward, a five page introduction where you, where I talk about some of the exercises are very vigorous, they're very structural, very stand up and feel that the structure of the hand or feel the hand like a triangle or a bird beak and others are extremely sensory. So there's these two extremes. And then the brain finds the middle and you, your hand end up, ends up playing differently from how it would have normally or habitually. So that introduction sort of goes through and, and gives you an idea of what's in store. And then there's a, there's a chapter with sometimes two full pages of just a detailed sensory exercise for the hand. I'm going to take you through one of these today. Uh, and then there are musical pieces which help you apply that particular exercise to an actual musical situation. And each musical piece has a, an illustration. So there's the sleepy, sleep, sleeping lions and the, the pogo stick for, for this one, dangling the hand and feeling the hand's skeletal structure. Uh, so that's the teacher's manual. This is kind of the, the Bible for the, for the whole series. There's a Pianimal's Pointers, which takes some of the exercises and gives you a shorter description of the exercise, just a summary, and a photographic illustration. So that you get, it, you get a chance to see, some people are really visually oriented, and so they love seeing just, they, they can feel in their own hand what's going on from seeing a photographic illustration of it and then of course your pupils they don't want to have to deal with all that they just want to be able to play so you're you're obliged to learn the exercise so well that you can teach it in the in a lesson to a student a pupil without having to, even to refer back to your teacher's mind you just know it and then you teach them the piece that goes with that particular exercise, but the pupil only has the music and the illustration, and sometimes a little bit of, of verbal explanation. 
So these are these are the pupils manuals volumes one and two. So now there's the four of the five books. The fifth book is simply all the pieces written out in primo secundo. So there the, the illustrations are very, very tiny. Here the illustration shows which part is the pupils. So here the pupil is actually playing secundo and the teacher has to play primo. Whereas in many of the places you'll see uh, here, for instance, the teacher, the teacher plays secundo and the pupil plays primo. So this is for, for class recitals and for when a more advanced pupil wants to accompany a younger pupil. <clears throat> so the playbook is uh, not necessary for the very first stages of, of acquainting yourself with animals. Uh, if you if you want to uh, acquaint yourself with it, with this uh, the the pupil the teacher's manual is the place to start or the teacher's manual plus pointers. <clears throat> Any questions so far? By the way, we have Hanno Beckers with us, who was the musical editor for Pianimals. Because of him, it's a much better book with really beautiful musical illustrations. Yeah. All right, Tiara, and, uh, do you want to say something, or are you just waving at Hanno? <laughs> no, no, um, that was just an applause. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great work. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Great. So our... Uh, about, of all the particular exercises that I've mentioned sort of in passing so far, did, did anybody really, did their ears perk up for, for any particular one, like what I said about the thumb or what I said about walking like this or instead of walking like this or about the direction of the arm or, uh, or well, there's also hopping and leaping. There's also very learning to play quick without, it's amazing, like we all think that who's going to be able, oh my gosh, you have to play the piano for years and years and years before you can whip off a scale like that, right? But in pianimals, there's this little exercise where you just do this, and you whip your arm away, you could even do just two notes, or the thumb in the second, or... And, and you'll find that even little kids, they, because it's just like drumming the, the fingers on the desk the way we did at school, right? When we're bored, we, blah, 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 we drum the fingers on the desk. And, and if you whip the arm away, you realize that, my God, what was slowing me down was my large investment of effort in every single finger note that I'm playing. But if I just use the arm for 95% of it, you, the, the, you'll realize that the key goes down with virtually no effort. And if you just, for instance, that, you know, there's, there's only a couple of grams of effort. That, but because it's going so fast, that, that couple of grams is enough to get the key moving. And so, so we, we start with Barmy Bunnies, which is what, chapter 16 or something like that. And we, you know, already in the first year, I've never figured out whether, I, I don't really know, this is all new, so I'm not sure how quickly, whether this volume one and volume two, whether that's going to be a, a two-year project to bring pupils through the, this whole thing, or whether it might happen more quickly, or whether it might take even longer, I don't know. It, I think it really much depends on the pupil, and it depends on how much time you're going to give to this kind of exercise in each lesson, because many of us are really time constrained in lessons. So the lessons are designed so that you can even just take five minutes, and very, very quickly do a little exercises and very, very quickly learn a little piece that's uh, related to that exercise. And then go on and, and do the other repertoire, which you need to do in, in the lesson. So if we, uh, does anybody have any particular requests for uh, what we're, because in this introduction, I'm free to explore any aspect of pianimals that you're interested in. 
and if you know if nobody has any particular thing then i'll do i'll do the introduction which is this weird floating arm exercise uh which is a it's not related to the conceit of piano moves, which is to start with the lying down exercises and to spend a year we won't spend a whole year but we'll spend some time equivalent to the baby's year where we do all sorts of things like this and all sorts of lying down and, uh, and and then start to play the piano by slowly standing up and standing up with the thumb which is a special case but this introduction which i i conceived it it it's apart from all that but afterwards i wanted it at the beginning so that this idea of the arm being completely free could suffuse everything which comes after it so we're never just doing the hand we're never just doing the fingers we're never just doing the fingers hand and wrist not even just you just doing all the way to the forearm it's always the whole arm and the body and the body which is involved in playing the piano so it's very easy when we play the piano to get focused on the fingers to get that kind of a just a mechanical fingery touch going but but if i brought my arm to it do you hear that the sound is more even the sound is more even because there's a true differentiation the fingers are designed to play notes one finger one note most of the time sometimes two the arm is designed to join two notes so much of pianimals is dedicated to clarifying the many many different ways in which we can we can clarify this fundamental division of labor that the fingers play the notes and the arm joins the notes see even if it's a trill it's even on one note for god's sakes see if i just sit there like a bump on a log i can repeat the note with my finger but there's nothing musical about it. It feels mechanical. Da, 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 da. It feels like a machine. And then if I involve my arm, it becomes a magical thing. The arm made the music. So if my arm is busy pushing the key down, it can't be making music. It can only be helping the finger make the notes. And when the arm starts doing that, the finger gets lazy because the finger immediately thinks, oh, the arm is helping me push the note down. I don't really have to do my job. But of course, when the arm says, no, 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 I'm going to join the notes, then the finger all of a sudden realizes, oh, my goodness gracious me, I have to actually move the key. I actually have to establish relationship to the key. I ha actually have to feel this key like a lever, not just a button that you press, but a lever which wants to come back up. The lever wants to come back up. Do, do, am I going to let that lever come back up? Oh, I let it come back up. Oh, that means it really is a lever. And oh, by the way, when my finger lets that key come up, my finger is behaving like a, a lever too. There's nothing blocked. Look, I can move that lever. There's no blockage. There's no blockage in that, in that key lever. Why should there be a blockage in my finger lever? As soon as I clamp it down, it's, there's no more lever. There's no more movement. There's a stop. And now I have to relax to get unstopped. And then I stop, and now I'm getting unstopped. And now I stop, and now I'm getting unstopped. Why stop and start like that? Why not just move? I can do that. I can play in continual movement if I understand at a very, very profound level this basic division of labor. The fingers make the notes. The arms join the notes. 
So that, in, in one sense, that's the background conceit of pianimals. But how that works out in practice, it will transform the way you play. Because it turns out that it, most of our playing is infected with a kind of a lack of clarity between these two domains, producing a note and joining a note. That's why I took, well, my first attempt was to take four big books and 250 lessons to clarify that basic problem, among others. But now we've got it down to 28 lessons. 29 if you include the body, the last chapter. So, in order for you to benefit most fully from all the lying down lessons, all the thumb lessons, all the standing up lessons, all the walking lessons, which begins with just a simple trill, and for all the running lessons, and the rotation lessons, and then the hopping lessons, the leaping lessons, and the fingertip lessons, because after all that, and as, I, as I've said before, Hanno likes to do this one at the beginning, to take the fingertip and just get his step. Because your fingertip in the end is the only thing that, that touches the key. All the rest is only in contact with the key through the point of contact, the fingertip. So that if that fingertip has a little bit of, eh, 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 a little bit of ability to really hook in. Not, the trick is, is to not to isolate. Because hooking and isolating, everything is going to freeze up. You're going to have tendonitis in five minutes. But if you hook in and allow everything behind to respond then it's a glorious thing then you have you, you have even more tone you have even more brilliance you have all sorts of articulations which were not available to you if you only use the whole finger so i like to use the whole book to prepare the entire body to respond to the hooking of the finger but hanno has told me that with many of his students he can do this finger hooking thing right at the beginning and you know he teaches it in such a way that there is that whole body response but now there's an immediate impression of what I do when I play the piano so when we were constructing piano molds, I was really undecided whether to put that fingertip thing at the end which I ended up doing or put it at the beginning uh, the way Hanno likes to do and I think I decided to put it at the end because not all teachers will be as wise and as informed as Hanno. So, <laughs> so I wanted teachers who, for, for, for whom this may be rel relatively new to go through the whole process of developing each aspect of how the hand touches the, the keys, all the parts behind the fingertip. And then, oh my God, we forgot about the fingertip. And now, because there was all this preparation, we add the fingertip and everything falls into place. So I understand Hanno's logic, but you know what? This is piano is for a wider audience, and meant for many people, it will be new. So that's why the fingertip comes at the end, and then finally the whole body. When you do all of these exercises and add the whole body, the rocking of the pelvis. Not big, huge movements, but a little bit of freedom for the pelvis to rock here and to rock there. Then they take on even greater power and greater ability to change, to transform the plane. Any questions so far? Or any more questions? We already had one from Ulrika, which I took about half an hour to answer. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a rather extended answer. <laughs> Okay, now, yeah. yes? It's not a question, but it's a comment. The the one where you were just rolling on the tops of your fingers, curling. Uh oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I, when I pay attention to that, I can feel it um, relaxing all the way up into my, into my traps and cervicals. <sighs> Thank you. That's great. That's exactly what we we're looking for. Yeah. Is that? And, and uh, in many of the exercises, it looks like it's about the hand and the fingers, but actually there are changes going back all the way back into the body. And so I'm looking forward to more. If I mean, I mean, if I got that just out of rolling my fingers, I'm like, wow, this is 
this could yeah. be really cool. You, you can feel another very simple way of, of feeling how the whole arm and the whole body is involved in playing is to put your one hand on the triceps, like underneath the underneath the upper arm, and then stand up on a note and then just kind of squeeze the note, like actually press, don't, just play a note, but then, and then press the note after you've played it. And then can you feel that there, oh my God, there's this huge contraction in the upper arm, the triceps. Yes. Yeah. So of course, uh, uh, I I was a student of Kemal Gekic's and he was pl- practicing away. It was in Miami at his house and it was warm. He was in a t-shirt and I was watching his triceps working like they're just going at it. He's playing away something like that, and the tri- you see his triceps working. I, mean, I told him, wow, your triceps are really in the game. It's amazing to watch. And he says, I don't use my triceps when I play. My triceps are totally let go the whole time. So I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> would you try doing what I just showed you guys and then and, and, and play while, while, while holding on to your own triceps? And you go, oh, my God, I never noticed that. <laughs> so you see, they're in the game, but it's so natural that you may not perceive it unless you do some strange exercise. Like, But the triceps are a fundamental stabilizer. Now, the thing is, when we get into the weighted technique and you're kind of falling and then standing up, then the triceps have a double job to do. They have to, their job is to stabilize in a standing up action. But now they have to catch the hand and stop it from falling and then go into that stabilization. So that's way more complex. And really when you're playing a mile a minute, the nervous system and the muscular system, they simply don't have time. And so it's, it's people manage, but it's not optimal. So when you, again, you clarify the, the finger plays the note by standing up on the note, then the, the, the job of the triceps is much simplified and you can actually go, go faster. So that's one of the things that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, pay attention to in this uh, eight week series. Now, uh, normally in the eight week series, there's a 75 minute awareness through piano movement lesson, which we're going to do one of those now. And then afterwards, there are uh, normally three, if enough people sign up, uh, individual lessons. So basically, the, you, you, you pay the, the fee, a rather modest fee, to attend the awareness through piano movement lesson, and then you're free to stick around and watch the lessons. The individual lessons and uh, after which there each lesson there's a small discussion so that's the format for the eight week uh, series and today we have had nobody sign up for individual lesson so i propose that we do an awareness through piano movement lesson and then if anybody wants to have a of a, of a, a little 10 minute or five minute or 50 minute spotlight just play me something you have a question anything at all we're free to you know to to just sort of get to know each other and to investigate the questions that are coming up about key animals so now we're going to do this um the floating arm the introduction of floating arm so would you please uh sit at the piano you mute, you mute your mics so that if you do make a sound we uh we won't hear it because there's too many people. Um, and take a moment at, at the piano to feel your sits bones on the bench. So you've got two sits bones. Uh, they're, they're, the Latin name is the ischial tuberosity. And basically, most of us can feel them pressing into the bench. So when you're sitting there, and it's amazing for those of you who've done this before, this exercise is worthwhile every time you do it. Maybe the hundredth time you've done this, and still it's an exploration, it's an awakening of the nervous system. Somehow, the minute I start awareness through movement, I was just sitting here like a bump in a log talking to you, and all of a sudden, my being 
not only my physical being, but my presence, my awareness has changed simply because I'm directing my attention to certain details of physical sensation. So is the weight of your torso evenly distributed between the left and the right sits bones? And if it is, you're the exception to the rule, because most of us are asymmetrical one way or another, and very few of us will sit absolutely even. And of course, there's many ways to sit. Uh, I'm going to face you for a minute, but you stay facing your piano. There's many ways of sitting uh, and maintaining perfect balance between the two sit bones, because now my head is straight over my spine and my spine is straight going down and it's right between the two sit bones. So they're pretty equal. But if I angled my torso to the left, so now I'm a little bit more on my left sit bone, I can simply angle my head to the right. Oh my goodness. Now I'm kind of, I'm bent sideways, but I've managed to keep equal, equal pressure on my two sit bones. And if I get really smooth and really adept, I can degree by degree by degree bring my head back to vertical as my body comes back to vertical without changing the equality of the weight distributed between my two sit bones. So you try that while you're sitting at the piano. And you just do head to the right and body to the left a few times, but try to do it in such a way, of course, the, the spine has to bend. Now, if does the spine bend easier if you're kind of rocked, rocked back a little on your sit bones? Or does the spine bend easier if you're rocked a little forward on your sit bones? Or does the spine bend easier if you're kind of just in the middle? But of course, again, between that forward place and that backward place and that middle space, there's hundreds of intermediate places. And so since one of those intermediate places and a little bit more bent to the side or a little bit straighter. And then maybe let the head go to the other side. So now the body's going right and the head's going left. And by degree, by degree, by degree, by degree, come back to the middle. And the first discovery is that if you do a relatively minor side bend, like you just put the, the head 10 degrees off the vertical, five degrees off the vertical, then then four and a half degrees and four degrees and three and a half and three degrees and two and a half and two degrees and one and a half and one degree and half a degree and then, oh my goodness, and back at the vertical. Did you do that all smoothly? Or were there little jerks? Well, go try again and go out there to that slightly bent position smoothly. And then you realize there's not only 10 degrees of diff of intermediate steps, there's infinite degrees of intermediate steps, if you do it really smooth. And if you don't lock into the movement, sometimes we start moving and then we, oh my, it's really going there. And then I, and that actually some muscles are already working too hard. So I like to play a little trick where I, I, I move in one direction, but half of me is moving in the other direction. So you could try it. You, Bend your right ear to the right shoulder and let the body go left. But half of you is thinking, I'm not doing that. I'm doing the other way. And go back, but only half of you is going back. And in your mind, you're going the other way. And you, and you find you'll, you'll use less effort to do the movement. And then you realize, my God, I was using more effort than I needed to. And so we're training the brain. This is a profound training to do the simplest of movements releasing ourselves from the need to invest more effort than is necessary. And when we achieve that, the quality of our movement in general is transformed. So now having done this five minute little exploration, just sit at your piano, I'll come around and sit the same way you are and notice 
is the sense of vertical with which you started now different? Like, are you sitting differently? Are you, you feel more vertical or less vertical? Or now you realize this is vertical, but before you thought that other one was vertical. And are you more on the left sits bone or more on the right sits bone? And don't try to make them equal. You freely explore being a little bit more on the left and being a little bit more on the right. And all the intermediate steps in between. <clears throat> now, attending to your sits bones, slowly raise your arm in the air, whichever one you like. Uh, but slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah. So, and then bring it back to your to your your uh, lap. Don't play the piano. Bring it back to your lap. So rest your arm on your lap, your leg, or whatever, somewhere down here. And now, remember the micro movements we were doing with the body: a little left, a little right. That is so tiny, you hardly notice movement at all. Now move your arm like that. So. The, the pelvis is micro moving, it's rocking this way or that way, and the arm is coming up extremely slow. Extremely slow. So it might take me how many seconds of that? Eight seconds to bring the arm to, to above my head, and then one, two, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand, ten thousand. Ten seconds to bring it up and ten seconds to bring it back down. Did you lock your pelvis? <laughs> this is extremely difficult to do this simple arm movement. Breathe, breathe, breathe without locking your pelvis. So let your arm breathe like that, but let the pelvis move and you'll notice the pelvis actually wants to follow it. And the pelvis wants to go somewhere else to help the arm get down. Well, nice. And then when your arm is back in your lap, is it in a new place again? Mm -hmm. So now you see why I wanted everybody's camera turned on because I I do like to see what you're doing, but if you want privacy, then it's quite all right. We, we'll, we'll do the lesson anyway. And you'll get the benefit anyway. Uh, don't lock at the top. Uh, now that's it. And now move the pelvis somewhere. Let the pelvis go somewhere as the arm's coming. Ah. <laughs> Did you see what transformed inside? Okay. Now we've only done one hand, so take a moment. Leave your hands in your lap or lying on your legs or even by your sides, maybe. And notice the difference between the arm that was, that was uh, moving and the other arm which didn't do anything. The difference between the two sides of your body. The difference in the contact with the left sits bone and the right sits bone. Is one arm longer than the other? So put your arms in your lap again, like somewhere on your thighs, maybe the, the hand on the thighs or the forearm on the thighs. Today, I kind of like the forearm on the thighs. You can see my forearms on the thighs. But maybe you want the hands, whatever. Now try the other arm. Ah, did you lock your pelvis? My arm's going up. It's going to take 10 seconds to get up in the air. And did you lock your pelvis? And what's going on in your torso? Is your torso struggling to breathe your arm up? This is like the arm is a lung and it just took a big in-breath. And do you lock at the top? It's like holding your breath at the end of an in-breath. Or did you just go over the top and down the other side and now you're coming down? And it's smooth, and the pelvis is still in movement. The pelvis can rock a little forward, or a little back, or a little back, or a little back. Or if you imagine the pelvis sitting on the bench is like sitting on a clock, then it could go to anywhere on the clock. Twelve or not, we did twelve or nine, six or three, but we could do ten o'clock, ten thirty, or eleven, and then. But just that that pelvis does not lock. As the arm raises up, 
But strangely enough, do you notice if the pelvis really stays free as the arm raises, that it, it's almost like it doesn't take any effort to, to raise the arm. Instead of it being a really, oh, my arm is heavy, oh my God. But somehow with the body moving on the rocking sit bones, somehow the arm almost goes of its own effect. Good. Take a break, let your two arms hang, and notice which one feels long you know. Of course, I'm a dummy because I forgot to do the reference move. The reference move is simply to play the piano. Play whatever you like, you know, a little, we were working just before in the study group on doing that or you could do or you could do or you could do okay kick him out kick him out that's the one piece I I forbade from my piano studio in <laughs> <Never to hear. laughs> So when you play, how free are your hands? How how much does your hand um, constrict or contract or somehow solidify to get a key down? And how much does the hand and the finger and the arm and the wrist and everything keep moving as you get a key down? Oh, you, you're going to steal my coffee? Oh, that's okay. I'm almost done. Too. Thank you. Nice shirt. That was my daughter. Um, now, come back. And now try this uh, breathing the arm thing. But this time when you come down, uh, let your finger drop onto a key, but leave the finger totally limp. So, and then it'll buckle. And then as the hand comes down further, it'll unbuckle. That's right. So if a note sounds, it's just by accident. Like there's a, it's a dead finger. It's curling, it's curling, it's curling, it's curling. Oh, it's uncurling, it's uncurling, it's uncurling, it's uncurling. And you end up with your hand in your lap again or by your side or wherever. So did you notice that there's a tendency for the hand to grip the key? Just when somewhere in your, in your mind becomes aware that, oh, 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 it's a piano key, it's a piano key, and ah, something solidifies and it plays the key. But this exercise is not about playing the key. This exercise is about letting the finger crumple and then the arm just continue to breathe out until the finger uncrumples. So again, it's this weird kind of not playing the piano. It's the Buddhist not doing. Try the other, try the other hand. Raise the arm up. Using your pelvis, keeping your pelvis free, keeping your pelvis free. Let the finger crumple. I've been doing this with my third finger. I wonder, it's possible to dangle another finger so that there's a, a crumpling and an uncrumpling. What do I mean by crumple? I mean the finger starts off kind of hanging kind of straight, although it's not completely straight, and then it gets curled because it's kind of mashed by the hand. And then as the hand goes down, it gets uncurled again. So all this is to, to make the fingers move passively while the arm is breathing 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 and while the pelvis is and it's not easy to keep the pelvis free and the arm free and the finger free as the key kind of crumples it and then it uncrumples because it gets out of the key by accident yeah. so this of course is very very different from Oh, too fast, Ulrika. 
uh, too fast, too fast, too fast. Look, when we get close to the key, I slow down so that that first point of contact, see there, it, there's a point of contact and then, oh, I'm very slow. So I can feel just when the finger starts to crumple and then, and then it curls a little more and then it gets all curly and then it, slowly it gets uncurled mm. because the hand went past. So the slower you do this, the more interesting details of sensation start to come into your perception. So, yeah. So it's like a Polaroid photograph, which starts off as a blank page and then slowly these colors emerge. So the more we do this, the more we actually, we start to feel our hand different from the way we felt it before. Ah, very nice. Keep doing it. I'm gonna watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to this exercise as you're beginning to discover. Uh-huh. Uh, Sindon, I would suggest one more variant for you. That's beautiful what you're doing. I would suggest a variant where you come down and then when the finger touches and it starts to, when I go a little forward, so I actually, my hand, the finger kind of gets curled in under the hand more. And then let it, yeah. So it actually, the curling was, it got into more of a curl and then got out of the curl more. So if I just come out already, then I curled it a little bit. If I just stay in, stay in, stay forward, stay forward. Oh my God, the, the finger's getting mashed. And then it comes up. It's a more profound, yeah. It's a, the internal non-action of the finger is more radical. Therefore, the sensory image, which is left in the brain, which is deposited in the brain, will be richer okay make sense so to sort of anchor that in my head would an appropriate word be mashing yes okay yeah Thank you. uh of course you know, words are always open to misinterpretation so we right. use we used mash and then some people started using muscular effort to mash it which oh. is not what we wanted at all no yeah, so we actually invented another word. We said, we said, okay, it's not mashing, it's smooshing. Oh, nice. So smooshing is mashing with the absence of muscular effort. It's just the skeletal arm breathing out that right. smooshes the key. And smooshes right, thank, the key. thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Take a rest and just let your hands relax and rest them somewhere, either hanging by their sides or resting on your legs, and notice the difference in sensation in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, eh? How can this non-movement make such a difference in the, the way my hands feel? So this is exactly the touch used for the first piece in Canimals called Lazy Lion. And... Uh, Oh, let me show you. Let me show you the larger music so it's a little easier to see. And I actually I actually like oh Christ, can you see that? I write a wavy line. Can you see the wavy line? Like the notes, there's the notes at the top have a wavy line going through them, a wavy dotted line. Anyway, okay, if you can't see it, I don't know. Uh, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> um, the wavy line is the movement of the arm. So the piece is played by going... But you literally, you just smoosh your finger. You, and this is where it gets really kind of interesting because all the piano playing re reflexes. Oh, I want to play that piece. I want to play that note. No, don't play it. Just smoosh it on the pedal. And for some reason, I did it 
on black keys. And I don't know why I did that. Because wouldn't it be easier to smoosh a white key? So it's played very slowly. And of course, eventually, it, and in performance, it'll be played a little faster, but the, 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 the value of the exercise is in slowing it down, slowing it down, and feeling the smoosh, feeling the smoosh, feeling the smoosh, and feeling the unsmoosh. And then, yeah. So doing it slowly is really, really great. Have you ever played the piano like that before? So then, of course, because people do it wrong, they, they constrict the hand in order to, well, they constrict the hand in order to play the notes. And then I thought, why not, why not actually do that on purpose? So in this one, we're, we're, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to actually, once, as soon as I've made contact, I'm going to stiffen my finger. And then I'm just going to go out the same way I can. So I'm no longer going to come down here and rest my hand in my lap. I'm breathing in and then I let that hand come down slowly. But I stiffen the finger and I go back out, out again. And I stiffen the finger and I go back out again. And try to be precise. Uh-huh, very nice in it. That's cool, Ulrika. Let's see, Ciaran. Ciaran, how do you say your name? Ciaran. Well, Ciaran or Kieran? Kieran. Ciaran. I like, I like Ciaran. Kieran is K E I. K I E R. Yeah, it's a little bit Kieran. different. So, Ciaran. Ciaran, let's Welsh see it. Name. Let's see it. It's a Welsh name. Welsh name. Beautiful. That's it. Stiffen it. Even a little more, like make it, make the finger stiff. Like it, it goes, ah, oh, I got stiff. It's almost like you want to resist. That's right. And not, it's, and there's no weight involved. So you stiffen it. So it's like you feel the poke going, moving you this way, actually. You see, if you did it very quickly, it would be like that. Yeah. That's it. And now do it sharply, like that. Great, that was great. Let's see Sindon. Uh, now Sindon, we do not buckle the finger at all. So there, it's not buckled, at, it, it refuses to buckle. First we were buckling it and now it, we refuse to buckle. And we just use it literally like a pogo stick. So. That's very good, Ch Ch uh, Karen. Um, but Karen, you need to mute yourself now. <laughs> so this is the pogo stick, and it's actually called the pogo stick. And does anybody remember what a pogo stick is? Because this is from my childhood. I don't know if they make those anymore. So it's, the, the piece will be like this. <laughs> That's actually the, the pogo stick. So you see, it's it. You don't stiffen the finger before, but you stiffen it instantaneously. It's just dangling, and then it's stiff. Great, Annette. Uh huh. That's right. Okay. So now, having done it wrong, go back and try doing it again. Again, right. Call, feeling the finger crumple and now is it clearer that you had some sort of inner desire to stiffen the finger and now you can really oh not stiffen not stiffen not stiffen just crumple 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 smoosh 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 smoosh, smoosh, smoosh. another variation would be to sort of like the type uh, like the pogo stick but repeat the note so this time we try to move the key with with it, the finger straight like it was in the pogo stick, but we don't stiffen it anymore. So now I just 
I dangle a kind of a rope finger like that. I dangle a rope finger. Or I dangle a different rope finger. Try this one. Dangle, 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 dangle. But no longer am I going down in my lap. I just go to the tightrope walker, literally like a tightrope walker. And I go back out again. Nice, Annette. That's very nice, Ulrika. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's fantastic. So this one is the, the, the actual piece. You have to do a repetition. So it's on one finger. I'm playing the, the piece, the, the teacher's accompaniment as well. Yeah. So you, you use this weird non-playing again, dangling, but, and it's literally you're imitating walking on a tightrope, actually hopping on a tightrope. Yeah. And this adding the repetition is the way of preparing the, the final piece of this group, which is Elegant Alliance, where you have to do the original movement Crumple, 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 uncrumple, 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 uncrumple. But you have to add a repetition. So I've written it with five repetitions, but of course in practice first you will just do one repetition. And then you will do two repetitions. And you will feel all the way through this movement, where does you're somewhere in your arm or in your finger or in your hand or in your wrist want to grab and stiffen and can you keep everything totally 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 loose totally totally as and can you keep the arm movement as continuous as it was you remember when we started we weren't even playing the piano we were just going up and with the pelvis and are you still remembering your pelvis and your torso oh i forgot my daughter like i forgot that's a valid excuse for everything it's strange sort of mentality i forgot yeah you left the stove on the house Brenda. Oh, i forgot sorry man <laughs> So, Elegant Alliance is uh, playing. The idea is to be able to play all that with never ever constricting the hand. That as loose as your hand was when we did the very first exercise, just from our lap to above the head, to the lap, and now you see why I said 10 seconds, 10 seconds. I've sped it up because I, I get too excited, but really we should have done 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Now, chapter 15. Oh no, which one is it? Floating Flamingo. Yeah, chapter 12. 
Chapter 12 does the same thing, but going up. Look at this, look at this. Do the same thing, do the same touch. But get one note, but do not constrict anywhere in the finger, hand, wrist, or arm. That's right. So it's the same thing going upwards. Yeah. And so the, here's where we learn that the standing action can be done as effortlessly as if I was just breathing in or breathing out. So he, this was this introduction. I don't know why I put it at the beginning because it's very advanced. Because this, there's no stand up in this. It's very complex to move that key and not compress the key at all and not stand up on the key. Whereas in Floating Flamingo chapter 12, at least there's a stand up. There's a stand up. There's a stand up. Yeah? Uh, so there's uh, a certain illogical quality to the way I structure the book. But I did it basically because my old teacher, Phil Cohen, who, who changed my life and uh, uh, this genius kind of piano teacher who was really into this whole, the physical, the physical choreography of every musical idea. He's responsible for a lot of this. And the first exercise he gave a beginning student was this. Yeah. So my friend, uh, my friend Robin Louder, oh, her, her name is actually Robin Sarah. She wrote a book about her studies with Phil Cohen called Music Late and Soon. Music Then and Soon. Music Late and Soon. And it's a wonderful description of the, you know, the way Phil worked and the way he thought and the personal. I can send you the link to, if you're interested in buying the book. And she describes this first lesson where, you know, her mother sent her off to this new piano teacher and he spent the whole hour doing this with her. And then she, she goes home and tells her mother, like, well, how was your lesson, dear? How was your new teacher? Well, we, uh, we did this for an hour. Oh, really? <laughs> Maybe we should find another teacher. No, no, it was really interesting. Oh, okay. And uh, later on, you know, she ended up playing very well, of course, because Phil was a genius. But he started off, and I really wanted to start pianos like that as well, so that this kind of this freedom will seep in and suffuse everything we do later. There probably would have been smarter to you know, do it first going up so that you have this, the basic standing action is already done with no effort. Because I teach many people to stand up and the whole first book, Craft of Piano Playing, is about stand up in an arc structure and then people are standing up and solidifying it. Of course, you can't play. You have one really great chord. You know? But then where, what do you do next? You have to move it. Which is why I wrote the second book, Honing the Pianist's Self-Image, which is about when you stand up, the human, the human beings are the only people who stand up on the two legs. All the other mammals stand on four. And birds stand on two, but that's not their primary means of locomotion. Only humans standing on two, stand on, stand on four legs, you're in a stable sort of balance, stable equilibrium. On two legs, you're basically like a pencil that's standing vertically. It's... It may be balanced, but it's extremely unstable. And the, and the sophistication of the human locomotion goes beyond all the other mammals because we're the only ones that have this sophisticated adaptation of a spine, which was designed to be horizontal. All the spines are horizontal to transmit movement from one end of the body to the other, but now that spine has to become vertical. That's why it's got those two curves to balance out the weight of the chest and the weight of the head to keep everything over the center of gravity, to keep everything movable, to keep the human body in a state of unstable equilibrium. So the second book says, you know, stand up into that art structure and now balance on it, balance on it. And now you're in a, the piano version of unstable equilibrium. 
I think I actually talk about unstable equilibrium in here. I forget. Or whether I tried to just say it in simpler terms. I think actually. Anyway. Um, so chapter 12 has this standing up into a state of unstable equilibrium, which we don't do at the beginning. Here we just crumple and then uncrumple. It's way more complicated. But I put it at the beginning because that's what Phil did. And it is, it's the introduction. So it's now afterwards we're going to do the rolling stuff and the thumb stuff. And, and, but hopefully this idea of a free arm, many people come to me and they say, Alan, can I do floating flamingo in this, this Chopin nocturne? And I say, of course you can. Like, and then this simple little, oh, let's do floating flamingo. Let's do floating flamingo. Let's do floating flamingo. All of a sudden, it's totally free. It's cantabile. It's singing. It's rich. It's got cl clarity and light filled. And there's no segmentation. That can be very beautiful, but it's segmented. So the, the, this idea of the floating flamingo or the one we're doing today, elegant lioness and lazy lion, this free arm can suffuse everything that's going to come afterwards. Because afterwards we're going to get a little, we're going to get a little focused on, on the rolling of the hand and the standing of the thumb and the bird beak and this and that. But if we keep that experience of the arm in the background through all that uh, process, it will serve us well. Any questions? What, were, what was your experience of this? I'm interested to hear. What are your impressions? I'm open to negative comments as well as positive comments. Anything at all. This is for the birds. Yeah, floating flamingo. It is a bird. No. Yes, Annette. Yeah, I find it really fascinating because it's my third time doing mm -hmm. this first intro. And thank mm -hmm. you for having me again. Mm -hmm. And I find it really fascinating that every time I experience something different and something new. And ah. it's really great. And today it was like I'm, I'm very aware of my breathing now. Ah. My breathing. And it was, I find it fascinating that my pelvis. It, it's not just one direction when floating the arm up or down, but it's more like a rotation. And there are so many sensations in the pelvis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like whoa, more yeah. like a spiral or something like this. Wow. And yeah. that's what I experienced today and what I find really fascinating. Thank you. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Well, I did, I've been sort of uh, thinking a lot about the, the pelvis and all these micro variants mm -hmm. and uh so i sort of i i did the, the whole preparation which we did before we actually touched the keyboard that, that's kind of the first time i've done that much preparation in this particular awareness mm -hmm. through piano movement lessons so i'm glad mm -hmm. that that actually yeah. really opened yeah. up your experience of of, of yeah. this, this intro great yeah. yeah it was really just a new tiny little bit but it was really making a Big different for me, or something new, or just mm -hmm. something new for me. Cool. cool. Experience. Thank you. Yeah, you're my pleasure. I mean, it's a discovery for me too. <laughs> so, so for the new people, you see that uh, this this the, the the eight week series starting January twenty second is the fourth time that I will have gone through this basic structure, but every time I do it a little different, and. Uh, if I have the time, I actually review the previous iterations. Like, what did I do that time? And how could I improve it? Or what new could I bring in? And I always go beyond what's written in the books. Because I find that, uh, you know, and I, I, and I want the teachers who are using these, these books to, uh, to use them as a springboard, to not just slavishly follow the exact steps 
There's a written out there. Now, we have to know the exact steps and we have to master them. But the, it's a point of departure. January 29th, Hanno said. Okay, I better check. <laughs> I don't know my own dates. Website, institutes, pianos online, uh, schedule. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Celery, right? Uh, 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 a topic. Oh, topics. If you go to topics, so this is Alan Fraser Institute.com, Institutes, Pianos, Free Intros. No. 26th is Wednesday. No, January 22nd is, is the first week. There's one more free intro on January 15th, and then January 22nd is the first week, and then we miss Hanno. January 29th, because okay. I will be at your place. Okay, so um, yes. so I'm, I got the wrong place. Okay, wrong schedule. Okay. Yeah, you, maybe you're looking at something else, but yep. the Pianos Institute 4 on my site now, maybe you need to clear your cache so you get the latest version of the page. Yeah, there's there's no class on January 29th for this. Okay. Egg -week, egg -week sorry, section. sorry. Yeah. Because I will be in that studio right there where Hanno is right yeah, yeah. teaching his students. Good. So, yeah, January 22 is the first class. And, of course, January 15th, there's another intro similar to this one. But, of course, I always do it different. So if you know of other people who are interested, please invite them to come along on January 15th. What other impressions or uh, questions do you have? about this lesson that we just did, but also about the whole eight week course. Like if you're interested in doing it, but have some kind of concerns or if there's something that's not clear, then now is the time to ask me because other, the other people here will also be interested. So are the free lessons, these lessons, uh, you were uploading these to YouTube. Will the other ones not be on YouTube or will they be on you? I mean, or how are you, how are you organizing oh. that? Yeah, uh, the the free intro <clears throat> was uploaded to YouTube public, okay. but uh, the eight week sessions. Now, what I was doing in the past was uh, <clears throat> uploading them to YouTube unlisted so that they're actually they're not public at all. And only people who have the link can watch can can redo this lesson and watch rewatch the individual lessons that will follow the awareness through piano movement lesson. Uh, but now I'm, uh, we were, I have a, another site called pianotechnique.org, which is basically the home, the host site for all my lesson videos, all my teaching videos. So uh, in times past, I just uploaded everything to that. And then Jovan, the, my former student who runs that site, he makes a series. And then you, uh, you are free to just go and get that series with a token, or if you want to join pianotechnique.org, then you're free to watch all the other lesson videos, which are also on that site. It's a really, it's a, it's a big resource. And uh, so I think this, this today, uh, with your permission, uh, if anybody does not want this on YouTube public because your face is on the screen, then you let me know and I'll put it on, I'll only do it unlisted. And starting from next week, uh, or starting from January 22nd, they'll be on pianotechnique.org. As long as, you know, we had some problems with the site, and I, so I had to use YouTube unlisted instead. But uh, we do, you know, we do, you know, have concern for people's privacy, which we try to respect, you know, and, you know follow the, 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 not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. If we miss a class, uh, are you going to be um, sending out a recording? You talked about people in Australia yeah. burning midnight oil. Yeah. So this this recording is the thing that's put on either YouTube Enlisted or pianotechnique.org. And then people who miss the class, they of course they can they can go and see the recording. And given, that, given that you've changed this lesson slightly each time, and the fact that we were like oh my god breathing and pelvis and arms how often would you you suggested part of this doing some of this daily but how often would you suggest reviewing these lessons oh that's a <laughs> uh, that's a good question i mean for instance like if you 
you know, I, I'm, I'm going to give a bargain price. Like if you want to buy the entire set of recordings for one of the past institutes, like I'll give you two for the price of one or something like that. Or, and then like you could almost do a different version of each lesson, like, you know, every second day almost or every third day. And then you know, just have and also you can repeat a lesson and press pause and spend more time on one part because sometimes I have to move through because the lesson has a certain structure uh, so that you might do one lesson, but you know, you might get tired after 40 minutes and, oh, and you've spent more time in one particular part and maybe you've created your own variants or something like that, which, and then you can, you know, continue the next day. So a little bit of awareness to movement every day is of course ideal. And of course it's not, absolutely necessary because of course many of us are busy i myself you know i don't i don't do awareness to movement every day uh although i try to move when i'm just walking down the street move in the in the spirit of awareness to movement because then i benefit but you know so there's a, a wide range you know some people they just do the lesson now and they don't have time to redo it but of course if you can redo it a couple of times through the week that's great Okay. Especially, you know, I think the more you redo it, the more you gain. There's a there's a point of staleness. Like I like doing a lot of lessons, but going back and doing something I did three months ago, and then redoing that whole series, uh, or and sometimes going back and doing the lesson I just did yesterday. So there, are, you know, the learning process, sometimes the learning can be great and then it feels stale if you repeat it too soon. And other times you repeat it right the next day and, oh, something gets clearer because it was, it was too fresh for me. I couldn't really figure it out. So there's lots of leeway in there. There's, there are lots of different ways that you can delve deeper into the, into the material. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Does anybody want to, Ulrika? Yeah, um, my impression is um, that um, my hand um, um, feels like tired, like uh -huh. it's very fast and- Very what, fat? Very fast it happens because we did not do a lot. Yes. Yeah. And um, I know the same, um, impressions from Feldenkrais lesson that is called the bell hand yes you, know, you, you do a lot and I'm I'm kind of frustrated because um they tell me do less do it slower and I for my impression I already do it very slow and very little and um but also now with the piano like not while play, playing the piano but just afterwards just now that the hand is like, ah, oh, it's tired, you know? And so I was okay, how to manage this? I, look, if your hand is very tired, that's a very good sign. It means because you did it very slow and you did very little. So why would it feel so tired? Like why, why is this big change in sensation? Because on a neurological level, on the neuromotor level, the brain did a lot of changes and the sensory nerves did a lot of changes and the motor nerves did a lot of changes. So now you take a break because your brain did good. And it, and, but that's the, the, the classic sign of the effect of a Feldenkrais lesson is that we do very little and then the, the change in sensation is, is out of all proportion to that little bit that I did. And that's, that's a sign that, yeah, something very profound is happening and that the changes in the neurology and the change in the way your brain will move you are, are happening at a deep level, at a good level. So it means that, uh, you know, when they tell you to move smaller and move more gently and move more, uh, in a, in a, more slowly, uh, in terms of reducing, there's no limit. You can reduce till it's just a microscopic, like a molecular <laughs> degree of movement. I've been doing Feldenkrais for 30 years. I'm a practitioner for 30 years. I'm working now with a, a very fine trainer named David Zimak-Burson, who lives outside of New York City. And 
we're doing lessons online and he's he's at me to do it slower and smaller and gentler and i'm following him okay like i'm the guy when i go to trainings i'm so always look you're not doing it slow enough you're not doing small enough i love neurological lessons like where you're walking the the fine line between thought and movement you don't even know am i really moving or did i just think it and then the, the internal stations change more than ever you yeah? know so i love that but you know I get somebody who's really good coaching me and he says, no, no, you've, you've got more to learn in that domain. So if you feel like they're telling you slower, smaller, gentler, and you're already doing it really slow, really small, really gentle, then maybe listen to yourself. Because if you're getting these big changes and this, this sensation of tiredness after that, it means you really did something good. Dude. Okay, it, it does not mean that I had too much effort in it. Well, I doubt it very much because I was watching you and I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. There's another kind of tiredness that's from too much effort. But I, I don't think you, that's what's happening with you. I, yeah, because I, I would not understand it either because um, I do so little and yeah, yeah but I was wondering. Yeah, no, the, this, there are many, many different kinds of tiredness. And you sort of, it's like you, it's a language. You have to sort of learn the language and figure out like, uh, you know, uh, but from watching it, from the way, even the way you describe the tiredness, that's not from overwork. No way. Yeah. No, you were doing it good. And the, like the, the hand goes, <sighs> and one possible uh, source of that tiredness is that the hand was overworking. And now the hand learns to work less. And so those muscles, those muscles may have stopped overworking for the first time in years. And then there's a lot of chronic overwork there. And now it stops. And then for the first time, you can actually feel how tired you are. <laughs> but you're so used to overworking that you don't feel it. But now when that overwork dissolved, then it's like, oh. <laughs> oh my God. I've had that happen to me many times. Like that that kind of like this like exceptional relief. Because there was this chronic work in there and I didn't know. So these lessons they're they're constructed, and this one especially, this one, it's constructed to to uncover that overwork and to let the brain dissolve it. Just... But you see these weird crumpling strategies. I mean, it's very strange and everything. But for that kind of change, very effective. So, you know, each, uh, each section of piano moves, there's a sort of a, an awareness through piano movement lesson where I, let's say there's four, four lessons in one section. Well, I'll do a one, 75 minute session which combines which goes through all those four lessons but i'll always try to construct a lesson which is more profound than what i wrote in the book like ah let's start with a little more pelvis or let's start with a little more torso and because you can only put so much in the book but if you have a really profound experience of this then you know you won't be able to give that profound an experience to a student and by taking five minutes of their lesson to do this stuff and improve their playing, but you you will give them a better five minute summary than if you only know this material superficially. So you will become like a Feldenkrais practitioner, like always responding to the student and and working with the student, even though you didn't do a Feldenkrais training. So it becomes very. Uh, Stimulus response, stimulus response. Every student will take to these, these lessons differently. And just in the most broadest terms, like somebody comes to me and they're, they're completely stiff. I might even give them an arm weight lesson. I spend all my time saying, no, don't play with arm weight. Like, but I might just, you know, just feel the weight of your arm. Just do that. With somebody who's completely like this, I will not give them an arm weight lesson. I'll give them a stand-up lesson. I'll give them a, 
a float up lesson or the fast version barmy bunny where you learn to play even a little kid they can learn to play very quickly of course you don't play a whole piece like that they don't you don't make them do that you just give this first impression and the neurology somehow picks up oh fast playing is not so difficult because we all want to go and then or i'm going to do that faster <laughs> good luck and you know people take a long time to learn to play fast but there are shortcuts if you know how the neuromotor system accepts new information and acquires new experiences and it's like you're you're building up a, a memory bank like a, a a movement bank in the brain but you put in little deposits here and there you don't put the whole thing together again uh, at the you you integrate it all later but this is and each of the pieces in pianos is just for one exercise ex except at you know in certain places where okay let's do a piece where you can integrate some of them so question would be, um, I mean, I, my piano teacher currently says that his teacher, he would watch him play fast and he was like gritting his teeth. Uh -huh. I mean, but if by the time we learn all this, is, there, is it possible to actually be totally tension free? Yes. Or, okay. <laughs> but it might take a long time. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Here's my... Uh... This is my DVD, The Craft of Piano Playing. Yeah, I have oh. it. Aha, uh -huh. oh my God. So, if you look for the instant, for instance, at the first, uh, um, and then uh, the, the playing at the end of chapter one, at the end of section one, that Bach, Nun, Konder, Haydn, Highland. If you look closely, You'll see me slamming down on the piano and gritting my teeth. Okay. So that was almost 20 years ago. And at that point, I was the craft of piano playing the book. The first book was all about structure, hand structure. But you, you'll see in my playing on that DVD, I have to redo this. I should really redo them and put them on YouTube as, so that, because now I would not play like that. Some of them, yes, I would, but that one, the Scarlatti was pretty good, uh, but that one I would, I would, I would, I would now, I would now. I would be standing. I would do much more floating flamingo, for instance. But there, I was using my structure, and I was still actually compressing my structure. I was confirming my structure by solidifying it, and now I've gone beyond that. So you'll see it, you'll see me gritting my teeth. And so, you know, the, your teacher or his teacher gritting his teeth, of course, we're all, we're all somewhere along the line of development. But this, this pianimals thing, that would, that will take you further towards not gritting your teeth anymore when you play even loud and even fast than anything I know. Okay. Because it gets into the, the whole body organization, which is going to free you from that kind of constriction. But like, you know, I have to say that, you know, I, I'm even when I'd been doing this stuff. 2006, when I recorded that DVD, I had been studying with Kemal Gekic for 15 years. Before that, I had 10 years with Phil Cohen. And like I was and I had a Feldenkrais training. I was already a Feldenkrais practitioner for 15 years. And, Tai Chi artist for 25 years. I was still grappling with these questions and coming up with answers. So, you know, and I must say that I went back to Phil Cohen in 2009 and uh, had eight more years of lessons with him before he died. And that was that what that's what really turned my corner and got me to the point where I, I wouldn't dream of gritting my teeth. Mm. Okay. But that, that's a whole body thing and it's multi-dimensional. There's so many dimensions to it, but this gets you, this is a pretty good summary of what you would need to do in terms of 
the mini body, the hand, and the whole body to organize yourself so that you can play. Uh, Karen, thank you for being with us. See you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, because we, we sort of we deconstruct it and then construct it in a way which is logically progressive, like the baby who starts off on his belly and eventually stands and then walks and runs and jumps. But, you know, a baby does not acquire adult walking until they're seven years old. Hmm. They walk at one and they take six more years to for the pelvis and the body and everything to start that complex it's so complex maintaining unstable equilibrium. It takes years to perfect it. So we can shorten that process if we have exercises which are going to put the right kinesthetic information into our system, into our brains, in, into our senses, into our reflexes, into our muscles, into our skeleton. And finally, into our ear and into our soul. <laughs> because when you play with this the sound of the piano is better and the ear is already hearing a more melodic tune without having to force it to be melodic it's just it's naturally singing and then the the adjustments you make to to that tune to make it speak the way you want it to make to make it speak are generally more subtle than this kind of oh i'm so expressive oh i can really play expressively like i did in that It was kind of overblown. I was going for a certain sound, but the, the ex expressivity, it's a little bit overblown. Make sense? Yep. Would anybody like to play something, even just two notes or a little scale or a little piece of music or something, just so that you get a feel for what, a, what the, the individual lessons look like? Nobody wants to. I'm going to make Hanno play something. <laughs> no, no. If, if, I, if nobody wants to play something, then Hanno is going to improvise for us, and I, I promise I won't say a word. I'll just, we'll just enjoy him, because he's a great jazz pianist. <laughs> yeah, but I got my piano note online. Sorry, man. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, Chiara wanted to play, but he had to leave. No, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. No problem. Yeah. Another time. Yeah. We're going to see him in January. Mm -hmm. Cool. Ah, I see Sinden is looking at something. Yeah. You want me to just plow in? Yeah, yeah. Or if you have any questions before, then, you know, if you want me to, you know, think about something in particular, or else just plow in as you wish. I will plow in. <laughs> Go for it. Can you hear it? Yes.
Okay. Okay, this is great. This is so interesting because uh, it reminds me of what I said about myself and this Bach thing that I played on the DVD. Like everything looks good. It looks like your hand position is good. It looks like you're... Just like you're sitting there, you're, you're playing the nose. And... Uh, pardon me, my piano's out of tune. <laughs> I... Hand structure is good, arms just there, the music's flowing out nicely, da 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 da. All looks good, and yet you say your shoulders are getting tense. Yeah, they're not tense, I could just feel them start to roll in. This yeah, is a... yeah, yeah. And there's, there's something. I use this piece as a way to practice three over two, which I'm not used to. Uh, so I, I'm concentrating really hard on trying to get the beats right. Then I notice that I start rounding my shoulders and start going into flexion. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the I love your armbands there. The I used to I used to like I used to like keeping my forearms warm. And I had a friend whose kid played hockey, and she had knit him some knitted hockey socks. And she gave I, I actually fell uh, three weeks ago and got um, um, hairline fractures. Oh, so this, no. is, this is a modified brace that allows me to play piano. Oh, my goodness gracious me. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking this like the, if you played like I felt that your it's hand little... structure is fine, but I felt that like exactly what we did in the lesson when we did floating flamingo, like if you could every chord. And so you could, if you could move your arm forward through every bar, like, I don't know, I don't know the notes exactly, but. That make any difference? Yeah, it feels a little less. Eh, 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 eh. Yeah, that's that's the the general idea. But you see, in most of what we're doing here, we get a double benefit. There's a physical benefit because you're you're actually under less stress, and there's a musical benefit because it feels less eh, 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 exactly like that. It's da bee, bee, boo, ba, ba, ba. But you see, with, with the if the hand is just a little bit inert then actually a part of my musculature is holding myself in this good art structure. And then, so my finger is moving against, you can't see it, but it's, it's moving against a tiny bit of resistance because there's holding standing mixed in with moving. My finger's holding me and standing me up at the same time as it's moving the key. But if my forearm comes like this, oh, Then I'm standing weightlessly, and now there's no finger effort. There's no effort in the finger itself to stand me up. Look, okay. when I get out of a chair, my body actually does most of it. Look, nobody can get out of the chair without moving your body first. You try to get out of the chair and without moving your body first, you're going yeah. nowhere. Yeah. The body goes, the body goes, the body goes, and then up we go. And actually, it's designed so, so that the, there's an automatism that opens the legs without that much effort. And then when you're walking, the primary experience of walking is not leg, 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 leg. The primary experience of walking is a, a flowing torso. No, nobody walks down the street. Yeah, we walk. And the legs are elegantly designed to do that. So but at the piano, we must we have to insert that consciously. If you play just the left hand and you took your right hand and put it somewhere on your forearm, you could enhance what you just did for yourself. And there's many ways. It's forward through four beats, or forward through four, through two, 
forward, back through two. You know, you can. You know, it doesn't have to be regular. You know, I think somewhere I don't know where it was that I think you. I've seen you talk about waltzing. That yeah. when someone goes dun 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 dun, and that's what you do when you're first learning to do the dance. That's There's right. Where you learn how to do one, two, three, one, two, three. And that it's a it's a it's a sweeping motion throughout your whole body that makes the waltz. Is that kind of what you're talking about here? That it's it's not it's not just one leg or the other. It's 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 always this. Yeah, this is it's just it, it's in four, so it's not a waltz, but it's the same kind of if I. So there's a certain down, but the down is only sweeping through a, down, a lower point in order to to come up again. So so these movements of my arm, they're imitating the the movement of a torso through space in smooth walking. Can you try? And just note, I mean, you're already doing it beautifully, but if you put the, put, no, put one arm on, uh, one hand on the other forearm. Okay. So, and then show me how the, Okay. Now let's add one more thing to it. When you walk down the street, do you push the ground with your foot? When you take a step, do you push the ground down with your foot? Or you just does your foot just meet the ground? I'm not sure. Well, they say that you don't they 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 the people who analyze gait say that you do not push the foot ground, that the ground actually pushes the foot up. It's called the ground reactive force. And so so if you could imagine, just imagine you are not pushing a key down. Like one thing I say in here in one of the chapters, I say. The biggest illusion in piano playing is that the key goes down. So I like to provoke people. Of course, the key goes down. But if you consider that to be an illusion and you consider the key to be a lever, mm -hmm. well, this lever is not going down. This lever is not going down. Oh, this lever goes up and up, but just by, just by accident. So you don't move the key down. You, you move a lever, move, move a lever, move a lever, move a lever. Just think you're moving levers and help your other, help with your other, that's already great. And now help with your other hand on the forearm. No, the, put the, one hand is a teacher on the forearm. So the, the student, the playing hand is a student and the hand on the forearm is the teacher. And the teacher is just gonna help. Get this feeling of this floating forearm. That's right. Try that. Oh, that changes everything. Look at that. Sure is a different experience, eh? Yes. <laughs> it's a completely different experience. So you, you remarked on something earlier. I mean, I didn't play piano for 40 years because I had such horrible tendonitis in my forearms and when i started playing again thank god that did not happen but is that partly why i mean i feel like this is like i'm not even playing anything when you do it that way i mean is that that's right you feel like you're not playing anything because the 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 feeling of playing is a feeling of putting that weighted touch into the key and of course that weighted touch into the key, that's why you got tendonitis because okay. you, you you weight the touch you push the key down and you use your arm now all the tendons are resisting that they're all stressed out already then you do that millions of times of course you're going to get tendonitis so this this you you thank god you didn't get tendonitis when you started again but if you play like this then you will you will never get tendonitis there's no there's no danger of it because now you're using yourself well you've accessed the dynamics of standing you know, when, I, when I'm sitting in a chair, I'm not sitting like a bum at all. Sitting is a dynamic activity. I'm rocking on my sits bones like we did at the beginning of the lesson. And then I transfer that to playing. 
But if I, I just have my other hand here to help the forearm realize, oh, I'm floating. It's like floating flamingo. It's like the introduction that we did tonight. It's all like that. And that changes. Now, now my finger stands with no duress, with no duress. My finger walks with no duress. My finger walks with no duress. So, so, so doing both hands together again, that's just probably slowing down a lot and then just feeling both hands sort of doing that, that right. motion. Yeah, that's okay. exactly right. That, that will be gold for you, pure gold. And I would just, you know, get a return on my investment by first doing one. Yep. So one hand is the other hand's teacher, and now the other hand is this hand's teacher. And now they've both experienced, so now you go back together. And... Okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure what the, the notes are, I'm just making stuff up. But you see, the, the, it's like the musical consciousness is right here in the wrist and the forearm. So if I'm if my forearm's out of the game, it's just notes. It's like a computer could do it. It's typing, and when my forearm's in the game, that's already musical thought. There's already a musical thought because there's direction. It's like talking. It's like singing. The, the arm needs to enter into this process where it's the musical consciousness. It's, when I play, it's like I have two little musical brains, one here and one here, and they're shaping the music all the time. So this is... What do you call two what? What you call two what? Two little musical brains. Oh, okay. A little brain right in here and another one right in here. And they're thinking and they're shaping and they're feeling the music and they're going with the music. And sometimes they're the same, and sometimes they're not the same. Because with the kind of cue, I mean, when I asked you earlier about mashing, and you said smooshing or something, would yeah. that be another kind of cue as to think of originating movements or, or or putting more attention on the wrist? So this this smooshing, oh, this yeah. is designed to just individuate all the parts. Got it. Now that they've all been. They're, they've been detached one from the other, and then they can put themselves together in a new way. Got it. So if I'm, that's, they're not even detached anymore. They're all locked together. But now, because I did this for a while, now I'm going to, the musical brain says, oh, walk over here. That musical brain right here is, and of course, if I just sit there and go dum, I can sort of do a, a rough imitation of what I want musically, but I'm not living it. And now I'm I'm living it. It's lived right in there. So it's bringing this, this alive form that's in the musical game, that's in the, the choreography game. But that's a, a new experience for most pianists because we were all taught to generic movement. Relax the forearm, relax the forearm. Fall down, then relax, fall down, then relax. So you relax, but it's all the same, and these movements have nothing to do with the musical shape. Movement has become automated and doesn't really reflect what the the phrasing is or the yeah. Phrasing. So like I just made that up, right? I didn't plan it. But yeah. it's like a dancer, you know, so he's, he wants to do a choreography, but he will also just move in a choreographed way without planning it. Because mm -hmm. he moves and his movement is expressing something. His movement is not just to, to keep himself from falling down. <laughs> so it's, it's the art of shaping the invisible. Okay. 
And so all of Pianimals is basically, it's a, it's a primer, it's, it's going back to the basics to prepare the hand to move like this. So I don't really, I don't talk so much about this. I mean, I, I do exercises which bring us towards that, but I find the way piano is taught is so far removed from this process, which I just described to you, that it, you really need to set it up. Mm-hmm. And you really need to offer pupils uh, a, a, a really a, a worked out way, like a, a systematic mm-hmm. way of, of developing the hand as the baby develops its capacity to walk. So this, this tries to map on to the the hand, the piano hand, what we all went through as babies and the first few years of, 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 of childhood in terms of development of movement. But of course, related specifically to, to music and with this special problem of the thumb, because none of us had a club foot. Yeah, but the thumb's kind of a... Anyway. That's sort of, I think that, does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, playing for us. And, th- you know, so now we, you know, does anybody else have any comments about what, what they saw? Because at the end of each le- individual lesson, we will have a little, a little a chance for a group discussion. Yes, Annette. Yeah. What I saw, seen when you played first was that your, your, um, your spine was very, very straight and stable. And afterwards, it was like a bit of swimming, swinging. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It was a bit movement. Yeah. 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 yeah so the, her spine was very good. Yeah. But it was a little bit too good. Like, <laughs> like it's maybe too, <laughs> offering too much stability. And when it transforms into, it has another job to do. It mm-hmm. has to actually support the arms in moving with the musical phrase. And so there's got to be a little more give and take and a little then it's actually more alive so it's interesting because your comment Sindon, was that you you felt your shoulders coming forward so actually maybe your shoulders are saying come on come on come on let's you know and maybe if your body had come forward with your shoulders then already your arms would be moving in the way which we eventually you know came up with like a strategy to get the whole system moving in sync with the musical shapes does that make sense yeah and then the other thing is i just got discharged from physical therapy last week i had a frozen shoulder for three years and she's finally gotten the shoulder sitting properly in its socket so now that i'm having a new body sense of what a a properly positioned shoulder is now i'm aware of when i'm coming forward again that's fantastic so for for you just out of the hospital you're doing extremely well (laughs) way to go (laughs) Yeah, hold on a second. You're on your way? Yeah. Bye, sweetheart. Do you have, uh, have enough money and everything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. See you. You look pretty. <laughs> yeah. Daughter's going to a party. Right. Yeah. What happened to your Steinway? Um, I, uh, my studio uh, schedule changed. Okay. So now I share the, the studio with uh, this lovely visual artist, this painter named Maya Mayolinica Jovanovic. And now she's, her teaching days are Friday and Saturday. Okay. <laughs> so I considered changing all the dates for this to Sundays. And then I realized my, like Saturdays, you know, so many teachers have a full teaching day during the week and Sunday's a family day and I should just leave it on Saturday. So if she finishes her teaching day earlier on Saturday, then I'll go over and, and teach from the studio where my Steinway is. But if not, I have this lovely white Petrov, <laughs> which I promise you I will get tuned. This is actually not a bad piano, but A flat is just horribly out of tune. Great. So this, this wraps up our first session, our, our second of three intro, three introductory sessions for this. So, um, 
thank you all for joining. It's been great. Uh, I learned a lot and I got to meet some new people and to reconnect with some old people. So if you are, if you have any further questions, please feel free to email me. I think you all have my email. Oh yeah, I promised I'd put Robin's book in the chat. Just hold on, let me get that. And if you want to, to uh, participate in the, the next uh, Cannibals Institute, the eight weeks, then uh, we'd be very, very happy to have you on board. It's still quite a small group, actually, so uh, it will be like this, re relatively intimate. And, and well, should, maybe I should just send you also in the chat, just uh, this is the actual web page for the, for the upcoming institute with all the dates and the, and the topics. And, and the rest of that page up and down, you'll have all the rest of the information about it. Is this a normal size class participation? Um, this uh, this is a little on the small side, but we've had some that are even smaller. Okay. And uh, the first Pianimals had like 20, 25 participants. Wow, that's a lot. And uh, it and it turns out that it didn't feel crowded. It felt like everybody felt that they could comment and, and we, all, we all got a lot of benefit from the group lesson and from the individual lesson. So, so uh, it's this zoom, you know, this uh, zoom thing is kind of wonderful. I mean, it has its drawbacks, of course, especially because some of the people who come, they have kind of low broadband, and then they're playing and the piano sound is cutting out, and whatever. But, uh, but, you know, the, the people being able to mute their microphones and then practice what they're seeing in the lesson in real time, Many people just think that's a godsend and they, they learn so much because they can really apply it immediately and then ask a question about it if something's not clear. So I, I found that uh, uh, the, the, even a, a relatively large Zoom group can work extremely well. Over 25 is a problem because then not all the windows are on one page. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I sort of, one of the models, I modeled this series of sessions after David Zemeck Burson's online lessons and he can have 250 people in a Zoom class all doing an awareness or movement lesson. And so he's got a big computer screen, but there's no way he's watching everybody. I mean, it's impossible. So he sort of scans, he will you know, move back and forth between the different pages of participants. And then luckily some people don't don't put their camera on, so that makes it a little easier for them. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it works well. When I'm teaching the Awareness Through Piano Movement lesson, I forgot to do it today, but I should really, you can, I can tell Zoom to, for, for me not to see my own picture. Because when I teach it, I tend to watch myself, and that's really stupid. Like, I should be watching all you guys. Like, I know what I'm doing. I don't have to watch myself. So uh, if I remember to do that, then then I, I do. So I can pay more attention to you guys. Because the, the lesson will all, often take a turn in some new direction based on what I'm seeing you guys do. It's a, it's a fascinating new, I mean, you, you guys are in on the ground floor. It's just like, this is just being created. Awareness through piano movement lessons basically did not exist as a thing more than a year or two ago. I mean, I, 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 I wrote lots of them in my previous book, but I never, never called them. I just figured out, oh yeah, that's, it's an awareness through piano movement lesson, ATPM. So, but, and I feel, I'm seeing now that every time if I watch the group, I can, I can take it in a new direction. And this, this, the, 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 the I, that's what I wanted to say, the grammar of spontaneity. Ruthie Elan, a wonderful Feldenkrais trainer, no longer with us, created a series of lessons called The Grammar of Spontaneity. And that's what I feel we're doing here. We're creating a pianistic grammar of spontaneity, where the sense of the hand in physical relationship to the key in such a rich way that all the movements are organically 
are, or are an, uh, an organic reflection of the musical structure. So if I have a series of chords, then it's not, they're not heavy. They're exultant because they're heroic because my hand really tried to stand up. And then, and then all my body followed. And I don't I think oh, even over Zoom, you can hear the difference. Like the first one, they sound like pretty good chords, pretty impressive. But in all that impressiveness, there's a slight brutality. And this one is really heroic and it really sounds like brass, a brass choir. And you can really hear each voice of the chord. It's really weird. If you use a weighted touch, it's a, har a homogenous harmonic sound. When you stand up, it's an individuated, where each voice of the complex sort of has more of its own space. They're, all the voices aren't kind of jumbled together. I mean, it sounds very good when it's jumbled together, but but when it's when, it's, when they're individuated, it's just that's it's a nice color, but it's more it's more individual yeah so that kind of thing everything you do sounds everything you do sounds if your sixth right rib is a little tense the piano soundboard can feel that <laughs> it's insane so this you know, piano is is a basic primer to move us in the direction to help us acquire a pianistic grammar of spontaneity so that we're freer to, and of course less risk of injury but the, the for me the deeper value is the the richness of the music that can result when the notes aren't produced one by one but when they're really strung together on a chain and each one of them on that chain is full of color and individuality so it's moving well to create a, a new pianistic relationship, a, a new pianism, which to my mind is actually returning us to the way they played piano a hundred years ago. Because when you listen to those old recordings, man, they sure sound different from what we hear today. And there's a lot of sweetness and individuality in the, in the sounds. So I'd love to get more of us back to that style of playing, which is, you know, in the, law, in the, the larger picture, that's what this this little 